Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect Epistle and Gospel for Monday in Holy Week. Almighty and everlasting God, who hates nothing that you have made and forgives the sins of all who are truly penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who of your tender love toward mankind sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all mankind should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may both follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Prophet Isaiah, chapter 63 Who is this that comes from Edom, with dyed garments from Bozera? Who is this who is glorious in his clothing, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your clothing red and your garments like him who treads in the wine vat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples no one was with me. Yes, I trod them in my anchor, and I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I have stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, and there was no one to help. I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation to me, and my own wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger, and I made them drunk in my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. I will tell of the loving kindnesses of Yahweh and the praises of Yahweh, according to all that Yahweh has given to us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has given to them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he has said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And so he became their saviour. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He bore them, and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And so he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit among them, who caused his glorious arm to be at Moses' right hand, who divided the waters before them to make himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths like a horse in the wilderness so that they didn't stumble. As the livestock that go down into the valley, Yahweh's spirit caused them to rest. And so you led your people to make yourself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, and see from the habitation of your holiness and of your glory. Where are your zeal and your mighty acts? The yearning of your heart and your compassion is restrained toward me. 
You are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, Yahweh, are our father. Our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. O Yahweh, why do you make us wander from your ways and harden our heart from your fear? Return for your servant's sake, the tribes of your inheritance. Your holy people possessed it but for a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those over whom you never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 14. It was now two days before the feast of the Passover and the unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes sought how they might seize him by deception and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, because there might be a riot among the people. Now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster jar of ointment of pure nard, very costly. She broke the jar and poured it over his head. But there were some who were indignant amongst themselves, saying, Why has this ointment been wasted? For this might have been sold for more than three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor. And they grumbled against her. In this lies the distinction. There does not seem to have been in Mary's act any remembrance of personal sin, though doubtless that feeling was in her heart and had brought her to the highest stage of adoration of her pardoning Lord. Her sin had been put away long before. Mary had sat at the feet of Jesus and had chosen the good part. The matter of pardon for sin had been transacted a long while before, and now, although in her heart there was a deep gratitude for it, and for the raising of her dear brother Lazarus, yet it seems to be quite absorbed in a detailed thought for her soul. She had attained an all-consuming love of Jesus. She would never have known that kind of love if she had not learnt to sit at his feet. To sit long there was a wonderful operation on the human mind. It causes even things that are good in themselves to be overshadowed by matters that are less and less to do with self. It is a blessed thing to love Christ because we escape from hell by him. It is a blessed thing to love Christ because he has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. But it is a still higher thing to forget yourself and to contemplate with delight the ineffable perfections of the one whom heaven and earth acknowledge to be a chief amongst ten thousand and altogether lovely. We love him because he first loved us. Here we begin and this beginning always remains, but on it we pile tear after tear of precious stones of love, which are crowned with pinnacles of inexpressible affection for the great Lord himself. He in himself has won our hearts and carried our spirits by storm. Now we must do something which will express our love to him. That love is not only a gratitude for benefits received from him, but an intense affection for his glorious, adorable person. Come, dear friends, do you feel that kind of emotion in your hearts at this time? Do you even now feel so perfectly has Christ won the verdict of your understanding? So completely has he bound in silken fetters every movement of your affections that you need to be doing something which shall have but this one aim to express your love to him who has made you what you are. Indulge the emotion, crown it with action and continue it through life. In this point, do not be slow to imitate the sister of Martha and Lazarus. O oh, sweet love of Jesus, come and fill our souls to the brim and run over 
in delicate personal service. The third beauty of this action was that it was done with considerable sacrifice. There was an expense about it, and that of no trifling character to a woman who was neither queen nor princess. I shall always feel obliged to Jesus for figuring up the price of that costly ointment. He did it to blame her, but we will let his figures stand and let us think more of her for his calculation. I would never have known what it cost, and nor would you either, if Judas had not marked in his pocket book that it might have been sold for so much. How he grudged that much. He calculated the value at three hundred pennies. He did well to put it in pennies, for his sordid soul revelled in small amounts of money which made up the pounds. Pennies indeed when the expense is for him to whom the silver and gold belong. And yet I like his calculation in pennies. It was ten pounds of their Roman money, but money then was of an infinitely different value to what it is now. And so it would have been an enormous sum for her to expend in one single deed of love. Her gift was costly, but the Lord Jesus deserved the very best and at the highest cost. Here was a woman who served the Lord at a higher rate than this. She spent only two mites in the doing of it, but then, as you know, it was all that she had. I do not know how much Mary had, but I am persuaded that this was a very large proportion of it and it seemed to her, no doubt, to be far too little for her Lord Jesus Christ. If her head was to be anointed, plenty of ordinary oil could easily have been bought, no doubt, in Bethany. The Mount of Olives was close by, but she would have scorned the thought of pouring common olive oil on him. She must find an imperial ointment such as Caesar would have accepted. Were Jesus to be anointed, there is nerd to be bought in the bazaars of Jerusalem at a very reasonable rate. Why must you, Mary, seek after this liquid ointment of the East, this oil distilled from the roses, of which it needs thousands of gardens to make just one drop? Why must you buy the very precious nerd and spend such a large amount of money upon that which will only last half an hour, and then the wind will have carried it away and its perfume gone for ever. But the glory of service to Christ is to serve him with the best of the best. He deserves, if we serve him with sermons, that we preach the best discourses a mind can frame or a tongue deliver. If we serve him with teaching in the classroom, he deserves that which we teach in the most tender fashion, feeding his lambs with the best nourishment. Or if we serve him with the pen, that we do not write a line that may need to be erased. If we serve him with money, that we give freely of the best that we have and much of it. We must see to it that in everything we do not serve Christ with the leanest sheep of the flock, or with such as are wounded, broken or torn by beasts, but that he has the true crown of our offering. We should not be content, if we are rich, to give him out of our affairs the cheese parings, the candle ends, such as we dare not keep back for shame. Usual donations have little of beauty in them. The money is dragged out of people by importunity, that guinea dribbled by custom because it is a respectable amount to put in the box. There is nothing to satisfy love in the slender oblations which come out like an unwilling taxation, which a miser could scarcely withhold. But to give the Lord Jesus freely, richly, whatever it is which we have been entrusted with, whether it be gold or genius, time or words, 
whether it is the minted coinage in our purse, or the living courage of a loving heart, or the labour of an earnest hand. Let us give our well-beloved the best we have, and he will call it beautiful. Mary's gift was all for him and all for love, and it was done at great expense, and so it was beautiful. Let us also remember next that this part of the beauty of Mary's action lay in the fact that it was done with preparation. We are told by John what we would not otherwise have known. Against the day of my burying she has kept this. Kept this. It was not that seeing Jesus there at the feast and being seized with a sudden thought that she rushed back to her cupboard and fetched out the little vase and broke it in a passion of affection which in a cooler moment she might have regretted. Far from it, she was now consummating the long thoughts of weeks and months. We have known warm-spirited brothers and sisters both say and do and give grandly, under a certain spur and impulse, that that they would never have thought of doing when they entered into the assembly. But let me be clear, I do not blame them. Rather, I commend them for obeying gracious impulses. But it is not the best way of doing service to our ever-blessed Master. Passion seldom gives so acceptably, acceptably as principle. Mary did not perform a thoughtless action under a tempestuous force of unusual zeal. No, she had kept this. She had kept this choice ointment on purpose until a fitting time come for putting it to its appropriate use. My own belief is that while she sat at the feet of Jesus, she learnt much more than any of the disciples had ever gathered from his public preaching. He had heard him, she had heard him say, that the Son of Man would be delivered to the scribes and Pharisees, that he would be spat upon and scourged, that they would put him to death, and on the third day he would rise again. And she believed it. And over the following months she had thought it over, and studied it, and worked out more of the meaning of it than any one of the apostles had ever done. And she said to herself, He is going to die as a sacrifice at the hands of wicked men, and I am going, therefore, to render him a special honour. I would not wonder if she had not begun to read the Old Testament prophets with that light. This is the one whom God has sent, upon whom he has laid the iniquities of us all, and he shall be given up to judgment, and he shall bear the sin of man. Then she thought within herself, If that be so, I will get the ointment ready to anoint him for his burial. Perhaps she intended as much as that so, for so the Lord himself interpreted the deed. At any rate, she thought, alas for my Lord, if he dies he will need to be embalmed, and I will be ready to aid in his burial. And therefore she put it aside and kept it. Against the day of my burying, she has kept this. Brothers and sisters, there is a great beauty in an action which is the outcome of a long time of loving, careful consideration. It is indeed a bad thing to delay a good deed which could be done at once. But if a deed can be delayed or must be delayed, it is well to be doing it at once by preparing for it. When a person feels, now is not yet the time, but I will be prepared when it does come, it shows that the heart is occupied with the love of a very engrossing character. We may sing, Oh, what shall I do, my Saviour, to praise? It were well if the question were constantly in our minds. Let each of us resolve in our hearts, I will not offer my Lord the hasty fruit of impulse, or that which will cost me nothing. But I will consider what I can do for him. Of what will there be a need? In what direction can I do him homage where he might lack that honour?
I will turn it over in my mind, meditate and consider it, and then I will rush out and do it. This last the preacher would repeat with emphasis for, oh, my brothers and sisters, it is a custom with many of us to get a grand thought, and then as we turn it over, to let it evaporate without its leaving even a drop of practical result behind. This holy woman was no mere planner and thinker, but a doer of holy deeds. She could keep her alabaster box as long as was prudent, and yet she did not arrive at the tempting conclusion to keep it altogether. She allowed her heart to weigh the project, and the more she weighed it, the more resolved she became to do it, to do it when the due time came. When she believed that that hour had come, she did not delay for one moment. She was as prompt as she had been thoughtful. The Passover was drawing near. It was within the next six days, and so she brought out what she had back in reserve. Blessed are the punctualities of service, which are the result of earnest endeavour to honour the Lord in the best possible way. There is something beautiful in seeing, as we have seen some poor woman, saving her little bits and putting them by for years, until she could accomplish a secret purpose by which Jesus would be glorified. It is striking to see, as you and I did see, a woman of moderate wealth, discarding all the comforts of life, that she might save enough that there might be an orphanage in which children might be cared for. Not, as she said, for the children's sake, but for Christ's sake, that he might be glorified. Such a wonderful thought is what Jesus would call a beautiful thing. Let us abound in such a beautiful thing for a man or a woman to say there will come a crisis when I will have to stand out for God and his truth, and it will be a serious loss to me. And then to ponder it, so long as to be almost eager for the occasion to come around, is a beautiful thing. To feel like the Lord Jesus, I have a baptism to be baptised with, and how I am straightened until it be accomplished, is a beautiful thing. A courageous, self-sacrificing decision for the truth of God, is a beautiful thing when its action is well considered and carefully thought over, and carried out with enthusiasm. God give us to mix thought and impulse, reason and affection, and so serve him with both the mind and the heart. But there is a fifth point of beauty. Mary did her great deed without speaking a word. Brothers and sisters, forgive me for commending this holy woman for her wise and fitting silence throughout her gracious act. She did not talk or boast about it beforehand. She said not a word while she did it and she said nothing afterwards. Martha was the worker and the talker. But I think that all you will find Mary saying is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so she was scant of words and had to borrow those from Martha. Martha had in fact said a great deal more than that, but Mary was quite satisfied to be as brief as possible. I believe she was a great thinker a great sitter at the feet of Jesus and a great learner, but a little reserved and not a great talker. When the time came, she was also a great worker, for it is very curious that although Martha bears the palm for work in our ordinary talk, yet Mary the thinker did more than Martha the worker. She, said Christ, has worked a good work for me something he never said of Martha, as good as Martha was. Indeed, he censured a little the elder sister for being cumbered about with much serving. But Mary's work he commended and decreed that it should be remembered as long as the world stands. 
though she does not bear the name of a worker in the vulgar judgment, yet she is the queen in the kingdom of a good work. And yet I remind you she did not say a word. There is such a thing as spoiling what you do by making a great fuss before you do it, so that when the mouse is born, people are only astonished that such a small creature should be the only fruit of the dreadful throes of the mountain. Moreover, there is such a thing as talking so much afterwards of what we have done that spoils all of it. It seems as if we must let all the world know something about ourselves, whereas the joy and bliss of it all is not to let yourself be seen, but to let the oil go streaming upon the master until he is anointed with perfume and we, ourselves, sink back into our natural insignificance. Silent acts of love have musical voices in the ears of Jesus. Sound no trumpet before you, or Jesus will take the warning and be gone. If we could all do more and talk less, it would probably be a blessing to ourselves and also, no doubt, to others. Let us labour in our service for the Lord to be more and more hidden, as much as it is the proud desire to catch the eye of man, let us endeavour to avoid it. I should like to know, says one, how to do holy work. Go and do it, and do not consult with flesh and blood. I have done my work now, and I would dearly love to hear what you think, think about it. You should rise above such idle dependence upon man's opinions. What it matters to you, what your fellow servant thinks. To your own master you stand or fall. If you have done a good thing, do it again. You know the story of the man who comes riding up to the captain and says, Sir, we have taken a gun from the enemy. Then go and take another, said the matter-of-fact officer. That is the best advice which I can render to a friend who is elated with his own success. So much indeed remains to be accomplished that we have no time to consider what has been done. If we have done a holy service, let us go and do it again and again and again and continue to do it, praying to the Lord always to accept our persevering service. In any case, let our consecrated life be for our Lord's eyes only, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Anything like a sounding trumpet before us is hateful to our humble Lord. Secrecy has a charm for Jesus, and the more carefully we preserve it, the better. Next, there was this beauty about the action of Mary, that she did it thinking to our Lord's death. The disciples shrank from thinking of that sad subject. Peter had said, That be far from you, Lord. But Mary, bearing her master's heart very near her own, and sympathising with him in his glorious enterprise, instead of drawing back from the thought of that death, performed her work in connection with it. We cannot be sure what degree she was conscious that it was so, but there is the fact. The anointing referred to the burial of our Lord. And it seemed to me that the best and most tender duty that Christians do for their Lord is that which is touched with the blood mark, which bears the stamp of the cross. The best preaching is we preach Christ crucified. The best living is we are crucified with Christ. The best man is a crucified man. The best style is a crucified style. May we drop into it. The more we live beholding our Lord's inutterable grief and understanding how he has fully put away our sin, the more holiness we can produce. The more we dwell where the cries of Calvary can be heard, where we can view heaven, earth and hell, all moved by his wondrous passion, the more noble will our lives become. Nothing puts life into men like a dying saviour. Get close to Christ, 
Carry the remembrance of him about you from day to day, and you will do right royal deeds. Come, let us slay sin, for Christ was slain. Come, let us bury all our pride, for Christ was buried. Come, let us rise to newness of life, for Christ has risen. Let us be united with our crucified Lord in his one great objective. Let us live and die with him, and then every action of our lives will be very beautiful. The next beauty, you may think, is a little far-fetched, but I cannot help mentioning it, for it touches my heart. I believe that Mary had, in the anointing of the Saviour, some little glimpse of his resurrection from the dead and of his later existence. For I would ask you, why do nations at all embalm their dead? Why not consume them in the fire? A mysterious something makes the ordinary Christian shudder at the thought of cremation. That must surely be an acquired taste. Unsophisticated nature does not court the furnace or covet the flame. We prefer to lie beneath the green hillock with our ancestors. Many nations of antiquity, and especially the Egyptians and others in the East, would take great care to anoint the bodies of the departed with precious perfume and to lay them asleep in fine linen. But why did they do this? Because there darkly shone upon their minds some thought of the hereafter. They remained with man long after the fall, a glimmering, undefined belief in immortality. That truth was so universally received that the Old Testament almost seems to take it for granted. The existence of God and the immortality of the soul lie at the basis of Old Testament teaching. The afterlife of the body was accepted also, in a manner more or less clear. Immortality was not brought to light, but it was there a recurring theme, and they who reject that doctrine go back into a darkness denser than that in which the heathens themselves dwell. Why did an Egyptian king embalm his father and lay him surrounded in spices, but that he thought that somehow or other there was another life and would therefore take care of the body. Surely they would not have wasted precious linens, gems and spices if they had thought that the body was mere rottenness for worms to consume forever. Mary had deeper and clearer thoughts than that, for she expected that something would happen to that blessed body after Christ had died, and she must therefore anoint it and bring upon it the most precious spices that she could get for his burial. At any rate, let your service for the Lord Jesus be the service of a risen Christ. Do not come here to worship one who died years ago, a hero of the past, but come to adore the ever-living Jesus. He lives, your great Redeemer lives. He will certainly come in his own person to reward his saints. And before he comes, he sees what you are doing. We live, said one, in the great taskmaster's sight. I do not care so much for that title, for I have no taskmaster. It is far more an impulse to my life that I live within the sight of him who, having not seen, I love, because he loved me and gave himself for me. If this does not motivate you, bringing you to life, what will? If this does not push you into tireless diligence in holy service, what can? Our Lord Jesus lives. Let us find some way of anointing his dear and reverent head, some way of crowning him who wore the crown of thorns for your sake. Ours it is to know that he lives and that we live in him, on him, should we expend the full force of our being, counting it all joy to spend and to be spent for his sake. I am not going to stir you up, brothers and sisters, to do anything for Christ, for I do not wish to spoil the freeness 
of your love's life. I do not want to be pleading with you to enter in his service more fully, for the work of pressed men is never that of the same quality as a happy volunteer. And yet, as I love you, I would have you love your Lord more and more. It is sweet to belong to Christ, and the more we can, more fully we can belong to him, the more free we are. I like that saying of Paul, where he calls himself the slave of Jesus. He says, exultingly, let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, as if he glorified to think of himself as a branded slave of his law. He had been beaten and scourged, and he retained upon his back the marks of his lashings. And therefore, while he was known to say to himself, and smile all the while, these are my master's marks, I am branded with his name. What sweet service, in which, if it was slavery, it would be joy. I would not have a hair of my head that was not my Lord's, if I could help it, nor a drop of my blood that did not flow for him, if I could help it. My liberty, and I speak for all of you, my liberty, if I might choose it, would be liberty never to sin again, freedom to do his bidding, and that alone. I would gladly lose my free will in his sweet will, and find it again as I never found it before, in having yielded it up completely to his command. I will not therefore so much as intrude upon the sanctity of your heart's love, as to suggest what you can do for Jesus. As the best juice flows from the cluster with the least pressure, so shall the best service be that which is the most spontaneous. Do not let me push you on, or draw you on, or drag you on, but be eager on your own account. Say to the Lord himself, draw me, and I will run after you. Have you not a certain private reason why you should love your Lord better than any other of his redeemed? I repeat it, I will not pry into your sacred secrets, but I will leave you to commune with your own hearts and with your Lord. Only let us so love him that when we look at him he shall say, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one of your eyes, with one chain of your neck. Then we shall know what to do for our well-beloved, and, what is better, we shall do it without any further exhortation. And there I will leave it. May the Holy Spirit bless this word. As for you that do not love the Lord Jesus, God be merciful on you. I will not pronounce upon you an anathema maranatha, but I tremble lest it fall upon you. I am sorely grieved for your sakes, I am, moreover, sorely vexed for Christ's sake, that he should be deprived of your love and service. What has he done that you should slight him? O oh, blind eyes that cannot see his beauty, deaf ears that cannot hear the charms of his voice. God be merciful to you, and help you to trust your Saviour, and then you too will love him for his salvation. It is no wonder that the saved ones love their Lord. It is a marvel that they do not love him ten thousand times more. May the Lord be with you for Christ's sake. Amen. From paragraph 13 of our Order of Service I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. 
he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all men according to their needs. Almighty God, who has promised to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that we who confess thy name may be united in thy truth, live together in thy love, and show forth thy glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Direct this nation and all the nations in the ways of justice and of peace, that we may honour all men and seek the common good. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Save and comfort those who suffer, that they may hold to thee through good and ill, and trust in thy unfailing love. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those who have died in faith, and grant us with them a share in thy eternal kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O merciful Father, for the sake of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Seeing we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith and make our confession to our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against thee through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve thee in newness of life, to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St Paul says. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St John says. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose nature it is always to have mercy. 
Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that me we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. We are the body of Christ. By one Spirit we were all baptised into one body. Endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and with thy spirit. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, thine only Son, our Lord. Because through him thou hast created all things from the beginning, and fashioned us men in thine own image. Through him thou didst redeem us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born as man, to die upon the cross, and to rise again for us. Through him, therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. Hear us, O Father, through Christ thy Son, our Lord. Through him accept our sacrifice of praise, and grant that these gifts of bread and wine may be unto us his body and blood who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks to thee, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to thee, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord, with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of his saving passion his resurrection from the dead and his glorious ascension into heaven, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. We pray thee to accept this our duty and service, and grant that we may so eat and drink these holy things in the presence of thy divine majesty, that we may be filled with thy grace and heavenly blessing. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, from the whole company of earth and heaven, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not a sharing of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread, one body. We all partake of the one bread. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. 
O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. Let us pray. As our Saviour Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, and his blood, which was shed for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank thee that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the body and blood of thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, and that thou dost keep us thereby in the body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people. And we pray thee that we may continue as living members of that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy Spirit. Go forth in peace. Thanks be to God. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>